Well, it's good to be back in the Lord's house. It's good to be back with you all again this week. Um, just a <clears throat> couple of things quick, quickly. Hopefully, we will be back together before the end of this month, we pray, uh, that we'll be back worshiping together. But I would like to ask and, and remind you all to uh, be praying for our missionaries, Brother Nathan and Brother Jacob Reed, uh, <clears throat> as they're facing some tribulations over in uh, Romania, Bulgaria, and in those areas, dealing with the COVID-19 situation, not being able to do a lot of things they need to to do and get accomplished. So they have asked us to be much in prayer for them, and I do pray that you will continue to be much in prayer for them and that the Lord will provide their needs and help them to be able to spread the gospel. Uh, <clears throat> also, let's remember all of our prayer requests before. Let's continue to pray for each one in our church. Let's pray for our church. Uh, I asked earlier for y'all to pray for Missy's mom. She got to come home from the hospital, but she is <clears throat> doing better, so I ask you continue to pray for her, though. Um, but we'll, we'll go ahead this morning <clears throat> and get into the Word of God. I want you to turn with me to the book of Psalms, the 46th Psalm, Psalm 46. And <clears throat> while you're turning and getting prepared for that, let me just tell you this, Psalms 46 through probably 48 are Psalms that deal with deliverance. They deal with the idea and understanding that God is enough that God is all-powerful, that God is the ultimate sovereign God. And <clears throat> um, these were written at a time when Jerusalem was surrounded by the Assyrians. Now, you can go back into Second Kings in chapters 18 and 19, I believe it is, and, and you can read about when Hezekiah was the king and the Assyrians had come from the north and invaded into the land of Judea and had surrounded Jerusalem. Now, this is a psalm of deliverance that was written at about this same time, um, <clears throat> and it it deals with the idea and understanding that God is our refuge, our security, our peace. He is all things to us, and we need to continually remember those things and remember that no matter what struggles and trials that we go through that God is enough and that God will rescue his people from <clears throat> from troublesome times now <clears throat> as we go through this and we know that through this time of of COVID-19 and I know everybody's tired of hearing about it we're all tired of dealing with it it's one of those situations in life whether you agree with the, the, the social limitations that have been placed upon us or whether you disagree, it, <clears throat> it doesn't matter. It, it's a time that, that we're facing and that we're facing together. And, and what I've noticed through this time as we're kind of a month in as our church is concerned, um, that we what I see and hear more often than not as I have talked with people uh, and as I have seen people and as you continue to watch newscasts and some of the things that go on, what we find is more fear and worry than we do confidence and being optimistic. We, <clears throat> we see more negative Christians, which is something that we don't just deal with during this idea of COVID-19, but this is something that we deal with on a daily basis as the children of God is how we reflect ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> this, there's something that you should ask yourself as you can go into uh, James chapter number one, and <clears throat> there's a couple of verses in there where it, to, to simplify, says, let God be your mirror. Let God see who you really are as you look in the mirror and behold yourself let God be your mirror and look and see who you truly are in your life. Uh, <clears throat> because 
what we need to be realizing is that as the children of God, we need to exude confidence. We need to exude optimism. We need to exude love. We need to be sharing these things uh, <clears throat> that we have learned from God's Word as we talked about last week, how God's Word is sweeter than honey, how that, that's where we get our education, that's where we get our teaching. Uh, our doctrine is entirely focused within the Word of God. It is infallible, it's perfect. There's nothing that can be added to it or taken from it. It is great. And we need to realize that it's a holy book. This is where we get our education. But once we have got our education in the Word of God, <clears throat> then as James also tells us, it's time to go out and be doers of the Word, not just hearers of the Word. That we need to go out and accomplish God's purpose and God's will. But to, to be able to overcome as in this time we face, but, <clears throat> but I don't want you to just focus on the idea of the, the coronavirus and COVID-19 because that's not it. I was talking with uh, one of our deacons, Tim, yesterday, and, and <clears throat> we were talking about how that there are more problems in the world that we're facing than this. There are greater problems that are going on around us, and these are situations that we need to know how to handle as the children of God. These are situations where we need to get back to the point. This whole time <clears throat> is testing our faith, okay? Just let me remind you quickly, God did not bring disease and death into the world. Sin did, not God. Don't blame God for the problems. Look to God for the solution because God is the problem solver. He is not the problem causer. Okay, <clears throat> sin caused all these problems in the world. I'm not talking about your individual sin particularly, but sin in general has caused these problems. So therefore, you and I have to put our dependence on the one who is able to solve the problems, not focus on the problem. <clears throat> we are still faced with struggles every day of our life, troubles, trials that come up that we need to realize the importance of trusting God. This is a time of testing for us. This is a time that will test your faith. Who do you trust? <clears throat> do you trust the newscast that you see on television? Do you trust the, those men and women that you see on, you know, Lord forbid that you believe everything you read on the Internet, but <clears throat> do you put your faith and trust in what everybody else is telling you or do you put your faith and trust in the Lord in what you know is true and real? Do you put your faith in Jesus Christ and what he did for you on the cross? These, this is the time of testing that we're facing. This psalm <clears throat> is a test of our faith. Whether you pass or fail, this test is entirely up to you because to pass it, you have to believe that God is enough. And I can tell you, He is more than enough. But <clears throat> let's go through and look at this. Psalm 46, let's start in, in verse number 1. It says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help. In trouble. Now, <clears throat> I want you to think about a refuge as because when this, think about a storm and how people, when hurricanes come and how they go to shelters that are there to protect them. God is our refuge. He is our shelter in times of danger and distress. He is the place where you and I will go and need to go <clears throat> to be able to put our faith and trust in Him. Remember, He is your refuge. He is your place of safety. He is your place of peace in danger when you have distress in your life, when you have tribulation in your life. He is your refuge. Now, this refuge does not last for a short period of time. It is eternal. <clears throat> Do not forget that God is eternal. He is forever. Every promise that He gives us is an eternal promise. It's not just a part-time promise or it happens until things get better and then He moves on to something else. 
<clears throat> God is always there for us. He is our refuge in these times of trouble that we see a very present help that's always there. Verse 2. Therefore will not we, we will not fear. Now listen to what he says. Do not be afraid. Jesus Christ told us time and time again, in John 14, he begins, Let not your heart be troubled. Do not be afraid. He told us time and time again, even as he spoke to his disciples, Do not be afraid. We'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> but he says, <clears throat> Even if the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, even if the mountains crumble, even if the world is destroyed, he said the waters thereof roar and are troubled, which we're talking about <coughs> waters that are flowing like in a flood with the rapids and all the terrible things where people can be washed away. This is what he's talking about. <coughs> Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, Selah. What he is talking about here is that we should not even fear even with the destruction of the world, even if we feel as if it's the end of time, we should never have fear. I've had plenty of people who have asked me, do you think this is the end of time? <clears throat> no. Do I think that it is a sign of the times that is coming? Absolutely. It is something that we need to realize. <clears throat> it's something we need to see and understand how easy it's going to be for the Antichrist to manipulate people into his form of a one world government, how easily people are going to fall into that because they don't know where to turn. They don't know what to do. They don't know the truth from the word of God. <clears throat> we see it in today's world with the way that people just fall into these situations without question, without thought. And I'm all about protecting people. Don't misunderstand me. We must protect the vulnerable. But we must also use the sense that God has given us and the abilities that he's given us to overcome. <clears throat> don't go break the laws and go against civil law because that's not what God teaches. What God teaches us <clears throat> is that we are to follow his word. We are to put our faith and confidence in him and not be afraid. Fear is one of, it is one of the greatest enemies of man. And it is also a great enemy of God. Now, there are certain types of fear that are good fears to have. Okay, there, <clears throat> If you are afraid... I gave this analogy to my grandson the other day. We were talking about being afraid. And I told him, I said, there are some kinds of good fear. Being afraid to reach down and pick up a rattlesnake because it's poisonous, that's a good fear. That's a common sense fear. That's something that God places in us that actually gives us knowledge and understanding that you don't reach down and pick up, try to pick up a poisonous snake. Right? <clears throat> but being afraid of the things that are going to happen, looking into the future and trying to read the future and saying, oh, what is the new normal going to look like? What are we going to look like? If we live in fear, then that is the enemy of God. Right? <clears throat> there are things that we see. There are scriptures that go along with this. Hebrews 2.15 all right. When you look at Hebrews 2.15, what you find, is, and actually go back up to verse 14, when you go back up to verse 14, you see that Jesus Christ died. <clears throat> he put to death, and it says in verse 14, to give us victory over the one who was bringing death at this time, which was the devil, it tells us in verse 14. But he said that, what happens is those that fear death as believers are in bondage in verse 15. The fear of death keeps you in bondage. As the children of God, why would we have any fear of death? <clears throat> death in this life only puts us in the presence of the Lord. 
but yet we walk around in fear of the destruction of the world. We live in fear of nuclear blasts. We live in fear of cancer. We live in fear of crazy people who may break into your house, rob and kill you. We live in fear. I'm telling you to use common sense, but if your whole life is based on the attitude of fear, if during this period of time that you are afraid to <clears throat> to do anything, then fear has conquered you and you have failed your faith test. Fear leads to worry. Fear and worry are something that we all have and all have to face in our lives. We all worry about things, but worry and fear to the point that it affects your faith are sin against God. What do we have to worry about? Do we trust God? Do we believe that God is enough even if the world is going to be destroyed? Do we believe that God is enough? <clears throat> Ask yourself this question. Is there any problem, any problem that's bigger than God? There's no problem that you will ever face in your life that is bigger than God that is stronger than God. We see people who face all kinds of struggles. We see people today who are in, in our society today that we didn't think would ever happen. We have people who are willing to go to work, people who are willing to do the things that are necessary to provide for their families, and they've been laid off during this time, and they're having to go to food banks, and they're having to depend on churches and other people to help them so that they can survive. This is America. We shouldn't be living like that, but we are. We are. <clears throat> this is a test of our faith. Who are you? What kind of person are you being? Do you trust God? Because God is our shelter. God is our hope. God is our future. God is everything. But if you live in fear and you begin to worry about the what is, God told us to take no thought of tomorrow. Jesus Christ himself in Matthew 6 tells us, don't even give thought of the clothes that you're going to wear or the food that you're going to eat. He said, if I fed the sparrows, will I not feed you? He said, if I took care of them, will I not take care of you? And you say, well, we have people who aren't being taken care of, and it's because we're not trusting God to provide. We're looking to, <coughs> excuse me, our own governments to provide. We're looking to other people to provide. And I, I'm not saying that our government shouldn't help those that need. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, who do you put your confidence in? Our government, or do you put your confidence in God? Because God is the Almighty not our government. God is the Almighty, not the world. God is the one who has the ability to cure disease, not the World Health Organization or the CDC or any other doctor or scientist who got their knowledge from God who is the Almighty Creator. Who do we put our confidence in? And I'm not saying if you're sick, don't go to the doctor because the Lord provided them with the knowledge they need to help you. If you're sick, go to the doctor. Get, <coughs> get the healings that you need. But the true healer, the great physician, is Jesus Christ. You see, <coughs> the Bible tells us in James 5 that the prayer of faith is what heals. We, we look at these things and we, we look at our faith and, and we blame God for the problems. We ask God for the help. And then when God gives us his help, which is his perfect will, we question God himself. Don't be foolish. God is not, as we've said before, and I will reiterate time and time again, God is not the one who causes problems. God did not bring death into the world, but God will use everything to accomplish his purpose. Right? God will take this horrible situation or any problem that you are facing and he will make good come from it. You can live in fear and you can worry about tomorrow all you want, but all it's going to do is make you sick. 
All it's going to do is cause confusion. All it's going to do is cause you to <clears throat> question. All it's going to do is cause you to stray. Where's your faith? Where's your faith? Look at what he says. As I said, this was a psalm of deliverance. In verse number 4, the psalmist wrote here, <clears throat> There is a river, the streams thereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her talking about the river. She shall not be moved. God shall help her and that right early talking about at daybreak from the very beginning. Now, <clears throat> what he's talking about here is that used to in the Middle Eastern cities, well not just Middle Eastern cities, almost all the big cities of the time, they would try to find a river <coughs> and put themselves in a place where the river would run through the middle of the city because this helped them. It helped them in their farming and in their agricultural producing ideas. It helped them as they could float up and down the river on <clears throat> boats and, and go from city to city. It promoted trade. But a river within the city was what sustained the city and gave the city the growth that it needed and helped it to be able to provide. Well, here, Jerusalem <clears throat> itself did not have a river that ran through it. Still to this day, does not have a river that ran through it. All right? But what we see is that the psalmist here is saying that God was that river that sustained Jerusalem. God is that river that sustains us, that gives us what we need, that helps, that provides for us, that delivers us from our enemies. Even though we look around us and we think that we may be surrounded by evil and wickedness every day of our lives, we have hope because God will rescue you. God will sustain you. God gives you hope. Why? Because He is enough. He is more than enough. He is all you need. <clears throat> he is your sustainer, your helper. He is the one who will provide for you as he told us that he would supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. Not your wants, your needs. We forget that a lot of times and we focus on the desires of all the things that we want. We focus on the idea of that the most important thing <clears throat> that we'll ever do is live this life. But what are you doing with your life? The most important thing is not living life, but what you do with your life. What have you become? Who are you? Are you spreading the gospel? 2 Corinthians 4, 3 But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. The lost are dying and going into hell every day, unbelieving, rejecting our Savior because <clears throat> a lot of them, when they look at Christians, a lot of Christians turn off those that are lost because they say, if that's closeness to God, I don't want it. If there are people who truly trust when I see them panic in these situations, they don't want it. If they see us continually focus on selfish desires and we become selfish ourselves or we begin to look down on people and we begin to act like we are separatists ourselves, that we are racist people, that we are better than those that are lost, then we forget we are sinners saved from hell ourselves. We forget how great God truly is. What do people see when they look at you? Who are you? Do you trust God? Do they see that you trust God? Do they see that during these times you have not panicked? That when you face problems in your life, that you do not panic, that you trust God? Remember, we talked about how <clears throat> prayer is our communication with God it's how we get things how we understand the things that the Lord will give us the fulfilling of his promises not getting the things we want all the time 
but receiving the blessings of God and having a relationship with God so that God can therefore see His will done in our lives. <clears throat> Through this we know Romans 8, 28 that we all know all things work together for the good to those who are the called according to His purpose. Those who are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. Those who are working and doing the things that are necessary. Even in Romans 8, 31 it says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? Hebrews 2.15 told us that death keeps us in bondage. 1 John 4.18 tells us that, <clears throat> the, that fear is not love. That true fear casts away love. That perfect love has no fear. We are not afraid. 2 Timothy 1.7 says that we are not given the spirit of fear but of power and love and a sound mind. Why? And it tells us in verse 8, so we are not ashamed of the gospel and that we will be partakers in the afflictions that come with sharing the gospel. The world is not going to accept us. But do you trust God? Or do you trust the world? <clears throat> in storms, in disasters, in problems that come, even in what we may consider to be small problems, I promise you, you can call on the Lord. He will hear you and He will help you. I'm not going to tell you that He's going to give you everything that you want. <clears throat> A perfect example. And this is something about getting to the point that you understand how much you truly are faithful, how, much, how great your faith truly is, how much do you truly trust God. When my mother got sick with cancer, I prayed every day earnestly. Multiple times a day I prayed for my mother. And I prayed that the Lord would heal my mother. Fifteen months later, my mother passed away. Did I give up on the Lord and say, God, you didn't answer my prayer. You took my mom from me. Was my heart broken? Sure it was. But I had an understanding that God's will is perfect. The greatest healing that the Lord ever could have done was to take my mother home, take her out of this world where there's no more sickness, no more pain, no more sorrow, no more death. No more trials and tribulations. No more afflictions. No more struggling with the evil and the wickedness and the negativeness of this world. God answered my prayer and He protected my mother and He took her home. If, if we can't be faithful in the situations, if we focus on self, it's my own selfish desires that wanted to keep my mother here but it's my love for her and the love for God that allowed me to let her go and to realize that God is greater than that. That she is in the presence of the Lord today and I will see her again. Why are we afraid? What are we afraid of? Why do we worry? Worry about what? <clears throat> do you want to, to live in fear your entire life or do you want to focus on all the great blessings that God has given us in this life. The ability that He's given us to change lives. <clears throat> you and I can change lives by living for the Lord Jesus Christ. By shouting from the mountaintop and exalting His great and glorious name. Because we know that He sustains us. He protects us. He loves us. Make it personal. He loves you. Chris and them uh, uh, sang a song a couple times that, that I just, I love. I love that song. And, and it's just, it says it all in, his, in, in the, the title of the song. He knows your name. He knows who you are personally. He knows you. Do you know Him? Do you trust Him? Do you think He's enough? Let me, let me go on down through here and let's look at what he, <clears throat> what he truly did. 
It says the heathen rage. The world is against us. The world is against him. The kingdoms. Uh, <clears throat> the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice. He just spoke a word. The earth melted. The Lord of hosts. Look at this and let this sink in. The Lord of hosts. God Almighty, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Selah. He is your shelter in danger. And then it says, come, pay attention. Come and behold the works of the Lord. What desolations... <clears throat> He hath made in the earth. Look at what he's done to those that are wicked. Look at what he does in verse 9. <clears throat> he makes wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariots of fire. Even in times of trouble, even in times of, of struggles, God will bring peace in wars. God has the ability to bring peace to the earth and He will one day when He sets up His kingdom. He can bring peace to the earth. He can melt the world. He can cause this world to come to an end in a second. He is almighty and all powerful. But we fear men rather than God. We fear man rather than the one that is able to destroy both body and soul in hell. David Jeremiah made a comment the other day. I heard this message, and I just want to share this with you. And this came from David Jeremiah. Like I said, this is not my thinking, but I thought it was a great point. I want to share it. <clears throat> is he was saying that, that we always say that everyone gets eternal life. You either spend it in heaven or you spend it in hell, but everyone will live for eternity. You will be in eternal damnation in hell if you reject Jesus Christ or you will be in eternal glory in the presence of Christ <coughs> with the idea of no more pain, no more sorrow, no more tears, no more death. All of this is great. But he said that he begged to differ with the idea of eternal life. The only way that you could have eternal life was to be saved. That those who went to hell did not have eternal life. Now, in this situation, I stopped to think about what he said, and I thought, no, now, Scripture teaches us that everybody's going to live for eternity, but that's not what he was saying. What he was saying is if you live in heaven, that's life. That's living. That's faithful living. That's truly Life. Life is vibrant. Life is that motion that gets you up and going. Life is action. Life is doing. But when you are living for eternity in the lake of fire, that's not a life at all. It's still eternal. It's truly eternal. But it's not life. It's complete and entire separation from God. The worst thing about hell, we can talk about the torment and the pains, and they are horrible. I promise you, they are horrible. You will have all your senses. You will feel every twinge of hurt. You will suffer for eternity. That's not life. Only Jesus Christ can provide life. I thought that was a powerful statement. I think it's something we all need to remember. But the only way you're going to achieve that life is to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, to believe that God raised Him from the dead, to believe that He paid your sin debt. He died, He overcame death, hell, and the grave through His resurrection. Because if you believe it, then your life changes. If not, you don't have life. There is no life. Putting our trust in God. 
understanding that he has power over this earth. Jesus Christ, we've heard people preach sermon after sermon, preachers who've preached sermon after sermon during this COVID-19, and <coughs> uh, Jesus Christ calming the storm, talking about calming the storms of life. I promise you this too will pass. I promise you this will go away. But even if it doesn't, who do you trust? We, we, we focus on the idea of the fear of the disciple and the anxiety of the disciples and how Jesus Christ had power over nature to calm a storm. But yet we want to put our confidence in something else. We don't believe that God is enough. We need to see that, that God is telling us, I'm not telling you to take, giving you permission to go out and, you know, to run up and hug somebody with the coronavirus thinking that you're not going to get it because I trust God. No, that's foolish. God didn't make you stupid. He made you of a sound mind. Remember, we're not given the spirit of fear, but the spirit of love and power and a sound mind, which means you're not stupid. You can't fix stupid. Ignorance you can fix with education. You can be taught to do different through the Word of God. But when you're stupid, that means you just go out and do things on your own. God didn't make us stupid. God made us smarter than that. God made us depend on Him during these times and say, no matter what, I am going to become faithful. I am going to grow. Why? Look at this next verse, one of the greatest verses in the Word of God, verse number 10. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen, which is the nations of unbelievers. I will be exalted among all nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts, look it tells us again, the Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The Lord is with us. Think about what we're doing. Who are we? Do we truly believe that God is enough or do we believe that the world has more to offer? What does the world have to offer you? Power, money, fame? How much of that is worth anything in heaven? <clears throat> you know, you say, well, Money can buy things. Things can't get you into heaven. The love of money is the root to all evil, the Word of God tells us. Not money, the love of money. Being focused on it, making that important. Having the money and having materialism and things. We get focused on, oh, I want those things and that thing. It's okay to want things. It's okay to have things. But when that becomes your focus, then you've lost your ability to trust God because you'd rather trust your employer to provide you a paycheck than you would to trust God. We have taken our life as Americans and the freedom that we have for granted. We have taken the blessings of God for granted. We have taken the ability to come to the house of God and worship for granted. Now God is telling us, don't ever take my blessings. Don't ever take the things that I have given you for granted. God is testing us right now. He's testing your faith. Do you believe that God is enough or do you put your confidence in the world and man and hope that they are going to solve your problems? There is not a man, woman, or child within this world today that can solve your problems. But I tell you, there is hope because there is God Almighty, the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, who is the, the solver of all problems. All we have to do is trust Him. You've got to believe that God is enough. Stop and ask yourself the question with who you are today. Look at yourself, as I said earlier, let God be your mirror and determine who you are. How much are you trusting God? How much do you put your confidence in God? How much are you living your life during these times and with all the other problems that surround you? Because problems don't stop. 
Just because COVID-19 is here, that doesn't mean that your car hasn't tore up. That doesn't mean that your roof hadn't leaked. That doesn't mean that you don't have other problems or that you've had other sicknesses that have gone on in your life. It doesn't mean that your family hasn't had more problems. It doesn't mean that life has stopped. All right? <clears throat> but who do you trust during these problems? When you're surrounded with all these problems and you don't know what the solution is, it's not your job to solve the problem. It's your job as believers to trust in Christ. It's your job as believers to share that faith, to share that trust with those that are lost so they can have hope, so they can see hope. If they see me and you live in fear and worry, then we're no better than they are. We're no different than they are. Let God be your mirror. I'm not saying we're better than anybody. But God has made us to be different, to be peculiar, to be zealous. Are we? Do we trust Him? I can promise you this from the Word of God. I can promise you this from the blessings in my own life. God is more than enough. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come to you today, Lord, asking you to examine our lives. Be a mirror for us so that we can see who we really are. Lord, give us a test to show us how much we truly trust. Lord, we're not praying for problems. Lord, we know as we look around, you see we already have problems. Lord, we're praying for a solution. We're coming to you humbly today, your servants, asking God that you help us to see and understand the importance of faith, the importance of trust, the importance of remaining faithful to you, the importance of living a life excited about your glorious blessings, living a life that is excited about spreading the gospel, reading the word, communicating with you. God, we want our relationship to become closer, better, more than it's ever been before. Lord, we want, as we come together this day, we want to let our faith grow. We ask your help in this. Lord, because we realize above everything, you are more than enough. We ask these things this day in Jesus' name. Amen.